Uh, thanks for coming out. We're winding down um, this Classic Gaming Expo 2012, so thanks for showing up. And um, I really appreciate all the guys at CG having us, uh, having us have a panel, you know, like John Hardy, Joe Santulli, and all the rest of the gang. So um, let's introduce a little bit of the guys here and tell you what RetroWorkTV.com is about. RetroWorkTV.com was began by two men. Men? Yes. John D'Elia, Lance Cortez, they found the site in 2007. It was one of the earliest retro gaming sites on the interwebs. And it's grown a lot in the past five years. It's basically an information and video hub. So you find um, written and video reviews of old games. You find um, articles about how to clean your games that you have. There's some, some collecting tips, but not too much. Uh, we might get into that a little bit. And you have series such as the History of RPGs. You have um, more in-depth analysis of things such as, such as the Universal versus Nintendo lawsuit, that Universal filed against Nintendo. So lots of things like that. So let's just go down the list and you guys can introduce yourselves. What do you do on the site? Yeah, no. Oh, that would help. What's up, everybody? This is... <laughs> Just, you trying to catch me slipping? <laughs> hey everyone, this is Billy from the Game Chasers. Yeah, yeah. Don't applaud him. I'm Jay, and I'm also on that lame show, The Game Chasers, too. So what do you guys do on your show? Who likes retro video games? Who likes looking for retro video games in various places? Well, and that's what we do. And we act like idiots. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, we basically ripped off American Pickers, but with retro video games instead of useless junk. Yes. So, so, instead of the useless yeah. junk. So it's all the joys of finding games in the wild. You, you haggle with, with sellers, you try to one-up each other finding rare games, and it's all the fun. You know, it's basically like your little kids having fun you know, in a toy store, basically, when it comes down to Pretty much, yes. <laughs> yes, don't expect a high maturity level on this show. <laughs> you mean zero maturity level. All right, we're going to go to Joey DeSena and his 16-bit gem series. So, Joey. Yeah. yeah. Let's, uh, let's get into you. So, how did you get into your, your video series, and what exactly do you do with it? Well, uh, my main series is 16-bit uh, gems. It's uh, well, kind of what it sounds like. It's uh, basically looking at video games from the 16-bit era, uh, ones that were overlooked at the time, uh, but really should get more love than they did, Earthbound. Uh, yeah. Illusion of Gaia, things like that. Uh, I also have a second series, The Way Games Work, which goes a little bit more into the technical side of uh, video games, uh, how they work. How does the 3DS work? You know, how does the the NES Zapper work? Things like that. Try to you know make it a little bit more accessible for everyone who's been interested in such things. And you might have a, a future project in the works. So if you want to reveal any details of that right now, or no, there's a few future projects. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> let us hear one. Well, one of them I'm working on with uh, my cohort here, Norman, the gaming Hi, historian. So I want to reference you a little bit in the intro about you take on sort of the heavier uh, subjects of video game history, such as the Universal versus Nintendo lawsuits. Just give us an overview of your series and what you like doing. Uh, my show is called The Gaming Historian. I joined Retroware in 2008. Old schooler. Uh, so I have. I think I'm the oldest person on the site here, but I'm also the youngest in age, so very proud of it. Um, my show just covers uh, important events that happen in video game history. Um, I do events, I do kind of obscure consoles. It's just, if you like G4 icons, I think you would like my show. So. And what's that uh, project you're working on now that I was alluding to? Um, Zelda. Oh, <laughs> I'm. Uh, it's not really part of my show. I'm working on like a, a full length documentary uh, detailing the entire history of the Legend of Zelda series. Um, I'm not going to go into anything about the game, like like the story timeline split or any of that, because that's just so confusing and doesn't make sense to me. Uh, it's just the history of all the games. Uh, start with Zelda One. It should be out probably by the end of the year. And the, and the good thing about that is that um, with Retro TV, we're it's like a team. And so in Norm's video, you'll see guys like Joey, you'll see Derek Alexander, who's a happy video game nerd, you may see Billy and Jay, you may see me show up to sort of chip in and give sort of a, you know, more of a... And, and who are you, Patrick? Who am I? <laughs> um, my name is Pat Contry. I am a 
hardcore NES collector, Nintendo Entertainment System, and I have a series called Pat the NES Punk. It's a review slash entertainment series. It's the best way to do it. It's like a hybrid. And I, yeah, I've been doing it for about four years, and I cover uh, not necessarily bad games, not necessarily good games, but sort of like unique games that came out in the system that people may not have been aware of that were either really good or really bad, usually good. Games like Panic Restaurant, games like Mr. Gimmick that you may not have even heard of, but once you discover them, you're like, wow, this is a really cool game. And that's probably what I enjoy most of that is when I get emails saying, you know, I watched your review, I went out and bought this game, and I'm glad, glad I did. Um, I also have a series called Flea Market Madness, where it's sort of a guerrilla flea market sort of venture with a video camera. And I'm not going to say I was the first one to do it, but um, I've been doing it for a while now. So they're better, by the way. The game chases are better than me. I've done some flea market stuff. But I give sort of like tips on how to go searching for things, how to haggle with, with sellers, what to look for when you find a PlayStation console, how do you tell if it's broken, you know, things like that. So that's what I do. And I'm, I'm involved with Retro TV in terms of some of the you know, content development on the site. So that's what I've been doing. So, but the question remains is that why are you guys here at a RetroWareTV.com panel? Why do we have a site called RetroWare TV? Why, why do we spend so much time talking about old games? Why are we at Classic Gaming Expo? It's because we love retro video games. And we were going to ask the question, you guys, why, like, why do you think people love retro video games? Why do you think, you know, you want to play a game 30 years in the past? Why do you want to do a series on a game Legend of Zelda from 25 years ago. What What is it about retro games? We can start with them. What is it about it that draws us back in? There's tons of new games out there we can play. We can ignore all these old, crappy games. So why do we still play these games, Norm? Well, uh, for me personally, it's all about uh, time constraints. Games are much simpler. Retro games are much simpler. I think they're a lot more fun. Um, there's more creativity because of hardware limitations. Developers had to get creative with their games. So I think... That's a big reason why we're attracted to retro games. Yeah, uh, I would say a lot of it is history preservation. Uh, this is a medium, an entertainment medium, video games like many others, like movies, like music. Uh, there are museums, the, the, the folks who run Class Gaming Expo who also are running the Video Game History Museum. You, If you've go down, gone down to see that, it's, it's amazing the collection they have. Not just, you know, the fact that they would go and collect it, but they would preserve it so that everyone can revisit this history of this hobby that we all love. Uh, and it's it's something that I think is important to remember and learn from. I think a lot of modern games maybe have gone down incorrect paths. Not that I don't like, we have, none of us dislike modern games necessarily. No. Uh, you know, not to poo poo them, but <laughs> I said poo poo. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I, I think it's important that uh, we remember remember our roots. Okay, now I think Mike's dead. Mike is dead. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're yeah. dying. Okay, so um, so we got into a little bit about um, simplicity of, of, of retro games, and it's something I guess I come back to is that uh, the simpler games, at least in my mind, games like Pac-Man, games like Super Mario Brothers, you require to use your imagination a lot more. Um, nowadays, you have you know you have games where the people look like real people, the settings look real, everything's ultra-realistic, a lot of times ultra-violent, that's another issue. And I think you don't have to think as much in video games anymore. Overall, it always is your imagination. Yes, you don't have to. It, everything's done for you. It's like you're watching It's like you're watching a movie when you're playing a video game nowadays. But back then, you had a, like, I think it was more of an immersive experience when you're thinking about, okay, Super Mario Brothers, you're a little plumber running around and you're jumping on mushroom guys' heads. That can be anything, you know, that's like... And so I think you can associate yourself better with the characters in the games versus a game like, uh, a game like, let's say, a Call of Duty game where you're just, you know, you're a modern soldier just shooting people in the head. So that's one thing that I think I come back to when it comes to, you know, retro video games is that, I think, not that it's more magical, that's kind of cheesy, but I, I just think, again, use your imagination and you kind of fill in the blanks a little bit more. I don't know, what do you guys think? I'm, I'm actually going to say it is more magical. Um, reason one is just childhood memories. You know, I mean, we all grew up, <clears throat> excuse me, playing Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and whatnot. And, um, another thing, in my opinion, is games were made better then than they are now. And what I mean by that is the games were made right. It wasn't put out and then... You know, the day it's released, oh, you got to download a patch for 45 minutes. So they they took they put more care and heart into the games to make sure they were they were right the first time when they came out instead of let's just hit this deadline, make a gazillion dollars like EA, and then we'll download a patch in a week. Do you do you think, uh, Billy, that 
uh, due to the limitations, say, obviously the technology limitations that the programmers, developers had to come up with, say, creative ways of doing you know, more with less. Any games like that, you can think of that, and you're like, wow, that's a really cool idea. And it's simple, and it's fun. Well, yeah, I think there's no doubt about that. And if you've ever watched our show, we do a lot more with a lot less, and we know all about that. But this, yeah, absolutely, you have to just, I think the programmers too had to use their imagination in a way, you know? So I think that has a lot, what you just basically said, has a lot to do with it. And I love the fact that, oh, look, we got two fans right here, and they're not even old enough to drive yet. <laughs> and, and, and these guys are just at this retro convention having a ball. And I love that. I love the fact that everybody on this site is keeping retro gaming alive. And I can't count how many messages that we've gotten saying, you know, watching your show has inspired us to go collect retro games and get into retro games. And I love that about this site. I love the fact that we're helping keeping all of that culture alive. That does validate my mind when a 15-year-old kid, sorry, uh, said, you know, comes and says, oh, I played Earthbound or whatever, and I really enjoyed it. And that, you know, that, that tells me it's not just the nostalgic rosy glasses. These are really good games that deserve to be preserved and replayed and not forgotten. Uh, I don't think that's, that's a statement that will be really argued with at Classic Gaming Expo. Sure, I think. Sure, I, think, <laughs> I, sure, um, I, I think, again, going back to the preservation of history, video games now is like the biggest money maker of any industry. It it's makes, been for a while, yeah. It makes, it makes a lot more than movies, TV, anything else. So now we're at the point where it's like we're kind of preserving the I Love, you know, like I Love Lucy, sort of. If we were doing TV, you know, we were preserving, you know, uh, you know, Citizen Kane of, of video games. That's the way I look at it, at least. And now that you have, basically video games as on home consoles is only 40 years old. If you want to get really technical, 30, if you really do around the late 70s. And so now you have these guys here, like Joe Santoli, these are guys that grew up with it as kids, and now they're getting uh, middle-aged, you know, let's be honest. But now they're getting replaced by, you know, there's a lot of young guys here that, you know, it's sort of like a generational sharing of experience. Maybe that happens more than movies, maybe that happens more than TV, because it's easier to sit down and play something with someone and, and explain to them what it was, what it meant to you. And using the internet to disseminate that information, using new media, is what RetroWare is all about. Yeah, and I think it's easier uh, nowadays, especially with things like YouTube. You go on YouTube, um, you can find gameplay footage of virtually every popular video game that's ever been in existence. <laughs> Um, so it's a great tool that you can trip over things and find things on YouTube you would never have discovered before. And so I think that you know retro gaming, even if say say 20 years from now the Wii is considered retro, it's never going to die. I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger. And so yeah, I've, I've actually got some emails um, from uh, college students and high school students saying, hey, I used uh, some of your videos and I used some of 16-bit uh, gems videos. I did a, a paper on. Uh, video game history, and I used you guys as a reference. And I think that's yeah. that's really cool that people are starting to, you know, it's it's kind of a, a resource. A resource, yeah, <laughs> that's the word. So, so any final thoughts before we move on to the next portion? No. Okay. Yeah. So this this next, uh, we're going to show you a, a clip of the show that we've been doing for about six seven months now. Um, and it kind of encapsulates all of everything we've been talking about, preservation of games, history, explaining to people what they were about. It's called the Video Game Years, and it goes year by year. We started in 1977. We're about to show you the a rough cut. It's somewhat rough. It's not going to be finalized, but it's somewhat rough. We wanted to premiere here a rough cut of 1979 uh, Part 4, and it just, it's, a, you know, it's a talking head show. It's basically like I Love the 80s, but for video games, and we have a lot of fun making it. We, we think it's a cool show, we think it's a cool premise. A lot of time goes into the production. Uh, I wish John DeLee was here so I can thank him for all the hard work he does on it. And uh, everyone from RetroWare TV is involved. There's also guests we have involved. And we interviewed a lot of really cool guys here that I was like, wow, these guys are going to be on future episodes. Guys like uh, Howard Phillips. That's uh, the I big was, one. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's, that's a spoiler. Howard Phillips is going to be on the video game years. You know, and David Crane and, and these, as you would say, luminaries of video games. So, um, yeah, let's show you part four of the video game years 1979. Let's roll that beautiful bean footage. Let's roll that beautiful bean footage. Is that what you're going to say? I don't know. You are from Texas. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
end of 1980, Space Invaders was getting blasted out of first place by asteroids. In this game, your ship must destroy floating rocks and shooting spaceships before they destroy you. Oh, there was one video game that uh, my nephew had uh, that was that was pretty good. You were like, I don't know the name of it. You were in a spaceship, a little flying saucer, and you had to fly around and avoid asteroids and shoot them. Was it called asteroids? It could have been. You know, I don't know. I freaking love asteroids. Whenever growing up in the arcades, I used to always play asteroids a lot. I love the vector style graphics. I love the fact that you, you shoot one large asteroid, they split up into smaller asteroids, they'll split up into even smaller asteroids. You get the random flying saucers that shoot at you too. So there's a lot going on in asteroids. They're everywhere. There's asteroids everywhere. What should I do? Shoot them! I'll shoot them! Pew pew pew! Pew pew pew! And then they go, pew, little ones, and they're going faster, and you're like, ah, my dad! How fun is that? Not very. I actually what? don't like asteroids very much at all. I don't like you. <laughs> I don't like the button setup. The five button setup was ingenious. You had like thrusting. You had thrust. You had uh, left, you had right, you had fire, and you had hyperspace, which was a giant crapshoot because you didn't know where in the hell were you going to go. Hyperspace would randomly send you to another part of the screen. However, if you use it too much, you'd end up blowing yourself up because you'd hyperspace into an asteroid. So no one really used that as far as I know because, like again, you had a little finger set up. But you had that you know, metacorpal thing going on trying to get to that hyperspace button. So I never really used it. It was scary. Yeah. You only hit it with your elbow while you're playing. That's how, that's how it was. I'm doing the asteroid dance right now. <laughs> Hyperspace was a good way to get out of a jam, but if you used it too much, it could become deadly. We're talking warp nine dangerous here. She can't take much more of this, Captain. I have no idea what I'm doing here. I guess it technically had like a physics thing going on because it was all based on momentum. Yeah. But my problem was I just tap on the thruster and I go shooting off and smack into a freaking asteroid. It doesn't just stop on a dime. Uh, if you stop hitting the thrust button, you keep going. I mean, okay, the physics is kind of weird because you go on one end of the screen and you come out on the other, so that's not, that's like cartoon physics, but. Well, the funny thing about, well, not the funny thing, but the thing is with Asteroids, is just for some reason it was Atari's best selling game. True, true. They, they even like swapped out some lunar uh, lander cabinets for it, right? In fact, they had to stop production of the Lunar Lander, another vector graphics game. They had to stop the production of those cabinets to use them for the asteroids cabinets, and uh, it did pretty well for itself. The um, the VCS port, Atari VCS port of asteroids in 1980, was a huge seller for the system. It was one of those turning point moments for, for the uh, VCS when they got asteroids on there. And there's a good example we mentioned before, I can only do vector graphics in the arcade, because the VCS version of asteroids was you know, big colored blobs. and. Uh, you know, it didn't quite look as good as the arcade version. Though I do remember the arcade version of the Asteroids, I believe, also had to use an overlay for color ah. as well. Yeah. The Asteroid soundtrack is just like Space Invaders. It's that heartbeat rhythm that just gets faster and faster as the game progresses. I remember when I was a kid, there was a cocktail version of Asteroids at a children's hospital I had to go to. And, of course, I was nervous about my procedure, so to take my mind off it, my parents said, Hey, why don't you go play Asteroids? Somehow it didn't set my mind at ease. Insert coin. In television. Intelligent television by Mattel. More sophisticated than any video game that has come before. Providing hours of entertainment for the entire family. In television. With one of the clearest game displays available today. Alright, 1979. In this year, Mattel <coughs> was the largest toy company. Actually, today, they're still the largest toy company out there. But in 1979, Action figures and Hot Wheels and Barbies, well, that wasn't enough for Mattel, no. The handheld game market was not enough. They wanted to make a console. They test marketed the Intellivision. That's an Intellivision too. Close enough. <laughs> Which is short for Intelligent Television. But they didn't just come along and say, hey, you know, guys, we got a system too. They basically came in and said, bitch, Atari, you ain't getting nothing on the television. Yeah, the Atari's like, yeah, yeah they're like, we got better graphics, we got better sound, we got better games. The one thing about the Mattel and television is the fact that it is easily my favorite looking video game system of all time. I mean, it's gold and brown and wood. It literally looks like the dashboard off a 1976 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. 
The Intellivision had a lot going for it, and there were a lot of things that actually made it a little more superior than the Atari VCS. The graphics were a little bit better, the colors that were used were better, the sound was better. The Intellivision offered graphics that you didn't see on the Atari VCS. They were impressive, and they also had the, the license of most sports outlets, like Major League Baseball, NHL, NBA, NFL, where Atari focused their efforts on trying to get licenses from the arcade, and television went for the sports titles. The Intellivision as a system actually did a lot of things first. Um, this might seem small, but it was the first system to have a full uh, font embedded within the, the system. Uh, uppercase and lowercase letters, which is really important for readability in any sort of game that's going to have text on the screen. And when you add the keyboard component available this summer, Intellivision can change your family's life. It simplifies financial planning, even custom designs a Jack LaLanne exercise program for you. One of the things I really like about the Intellivision are the controllers. You have the 16-way directional desk here, you would also put a joystick on there as well and use it that way. It's a little bit more like a TV remote. It's got all the buttons and the enter and blah, 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 blah. I think it was like 12 buttons, 12 plus 4 buttons on the side, I think. So it's like 16 buttons on the freaking thing. The controller for the Intellivision was quite unique. Kept that golden brown feel. It had the, the phone number pad. Look like a freaking telephone. Uh, you know, what, what, I'm gonna call my grandmother, I'm gonna play video games here, right? Hello? And one of the other things that Intellivision did differently is they had these controls that utilized these little overlays. Basically, they were overlays just like this. Small little pieces of plastic that you just put on top of your controller that had different functions or, or showed you different keypad motions for the video game that you're playing. Back in the day, if you lost those overlays, you couldn't play the game unless you remembered what all the buttons you know did. Uh, nowadays, you can obviously go on the internet and you know look them up, but back then, back then you lost them. What were you going to do? Buy the game again and ask a friend? If you actually open up an Intellivision controller to try to service it, as I had to do recently, this is what your Intellivision controller is printed on. There's no circuit board. This is barely stronger than snack cake packaging, and they just put the circuits directly on it. Not only that, but certain parts, like sensitive areas, like where the control disc goes, there is no buffer between the discs, so it actually grinds rings into the circuit itself. I personally hate this controller. Luckily, you know, you can, uh, well, not luckily about anything, you have to use this controller. The Intellivision had a huge library of games. I mean, the system spanned almost 10 years. Of course it had a huge library of games. We can sit here and we can go down the list, we can name off all of the cool games that came out for the system. The Tron games that they did, Deadly Discs was just one of them, but you know, this wasn't on uh, any other system at the time, and it was unique, the movie was popular, and it's considered to be a decent game. Um, games like Burger Time had their only sequel in Diner, like a true sequel, and it was only on in television, and that's pretty cool. Kind of a hard game to come by, but it's a really fun port. It's very unique. So if you like Burger Time, check out Diner for the Intelligent. Me and my friends love Night Stalker. The bats are so scary. Well, your friends aren't going to have this newest one. It's Frog Bog. Oh, man. <laughs> They're not going to believe this. Oh, man. Microsurgeon. Really? The first health medical video game. And then you go inside someone's body and try to figure out what's wrong. <laughs> Open that? No, seal. One of my favorite games with the television is He Man, The Power of He Man. And this is a really fun port. There's several different stages. You got this hovercraft stage, you also have a stage where Skeletor's shooting little fireballs at He Man and he's trying to avoid them. I love the sound effects, the, the sound of the swords hitting each other, and the music from the actual cartoon. It's a really great port. And then we have, like, these games I don't about, the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons games. Um, this one is the, uh, the Tarman one, which is kind of cool because it's one of the first first-person dungeon crawls uh, that you see, and certainly the first one that was ever done on a home console. So it's kind of the, the start of RPGs taking off. Star Strike was an amazing kind of a Star Wars for uh, you, you had to actually fly into the trench, but it was green, uh, and dropped a little 
uh, torpedo into the target. But one cool thing to know is that the Atari actually ported some of their games over to the Intellivision, their competitor. And Mattel actually did the exact same thing to the Atari, porting some of their games over under what they called the M network. Much like Atari, Mattel actually licensed the Intellivision out to third party companies. For example, you had Radio Shack, the Tandy Vision, which was Radio Shack's version of the Intellivision. You also had the Super Video Arcade, which was available at Sears, which is also another version of the Intellivision. Masters of the Universe, the power of He-Man for the Intellivision. And this is Masters of the Universe, the power of He-Man, M-Network style, ported over to the Atari. Yeah. Two million units sold. 1979 is pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty damn good. In television. In television. Coming up next on the Video Game Years. See, it's little known fact. There was one guy that worked at Atari the whole time. It wasn't Nolan Bushnell, it was Mr. Atari. It's who the company was named after. And he was working in like this magical shop of wonders, and you know. Someone would say, I would like to buy a game. And he would say, oh, okay, let me come up with the game. And he would you know, take his little pen and he would sketch out the circuit board and then wave a magic wand and then the circuit board would come alive with little magical elves that would tink, 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 conk, 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 and they would go and they would, you know, like smelt the gold uh, for the contacts and, and they would copper and they would code in there, uh, the game itself, uh, to Mr. Atari's specifications, and then after about, you know, three milliseconds, because that will also work fast, man, um, poof, they would have the game. There's the game right there, and he'd go, oh, Space Invaders, I shall sell this and make a trillion dollars until Warner Communications buys me out and runs me to the ground. <laughs> and that is the true story of Atari, but no one else tell you different. What was I talking about? Okay, well, yeah, I'm not sure how sure accurate that last part was. <laughs> so that was uh, a rough cut. rough cut of part four of 1979. We'll probably make a little bit of uh, additions and uh, cut out a little bit here and there. But that was it. And the last part, uh, I, don't, I don't know why that was there, but that, that probably won't make it into 79, but I think well, it's that's fine. A, that's a preview of 1980, actually. Preview of 1980, that's, that's right. That's wearing the members only jacket. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> that means 80. <laughs> that's the story, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so, sorry, Norm. That's all I got. Okay. So the goal is we're going to keep doing these uh, until we grow sick of them, or John Delia collapses from the strain of editing these. Um, but we're going to do, you know, we, at least we do a year every two months, but we're going to be quicker in the future because we have uh, a team on board now to help edit. So some, I, some of you a wonderful audience. team. Yeah, we have Mark in here who's going to help edit some of it. So we have 1980, probably part one of 80. It'll probably come out, if not the end of this month, early August, but, you know, after that, you know, a year every, every couple of months, and every episode is 45 complete minutes. So we're talking like, yeah, full TV episodes. So uh, that, that basically, that's it for, for the beginning of the year. So we're going to open up for a Q&A for the remaining about 15 minutes we have left. If you have any questions about any of us, the Game Chasers, me, Joey, Norm, Retro TV, the video game year, it's just, yeah, let's, let's uh, have some questions. Or, or Mr. Atari. Or Mr. Atari. We can have more tales from Mr. Atari. What was his first name? <laughs> Mr. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> you weren't listening. Any questions? Anything. All right. Question up front. Uh, yeah, um, I'd like to ask the um, 16-bit group um, how you would differentiate your site from the 8-bit or from The question: How do we differentiate uh, some of the 8-bit from 16-bit example games? Well, the, the, no, the site. The site. I mean, is it arranged differently? Well, basically, the site's set up uh, by show. Um, so right now, we we have about. 12 different contributors to the, sh uh, to the website. So for example, we have someone named Clint who does a series called Lazy Game Reviews, which is an old 80s uh, like Commodore and early PC era review show. Joey does 16-bit gems. 
which is uh, mostly Super Nintendo, some Sega Genesis, some TurboGrafx-16 reviews. Um, I review mostly NES games uh, on my show. Um, I'm missing people. There's like Eric uh, from uh, Let's Get. He reviews uh, more 90s, more 90s and 64 PlayStation era uh, games. Um, so yeah, it's kind of more divided by my personality for the most part. But we also have a user uh, community that submits um, their own reviews, own things like that, and then we promote that. And then so we have some people doing some some you know Atari reviews as well. Yeah, there's also some uh, kind of site-wide shows like Game Quickies. That cover that, that that are done by multiple people on the site. Yeah, so by there's themselves. Yeah, there's, there's like game out. quickies that are like short reviews that anyone can say, hey, I want to do a Sega Master System review, I want to do a Super Nintendo review, let's just jump in and do it. Yeah, we we take user submissions as well. So if any of you say, hey, I want to uh, do a review, whether it be a video or an article, you can submit it to Retroware and it'll be on the site for everybody to read and you can share it. And it's also like like Joey, for example, put out um, a how to clean game cartridges, like collecting tips video. So stuff like that's on on the site as well. Any other questions? Anything? Any Earthbound questions for Joey? Since he loves Earthbound. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right, Joe, Joey, when's the next 16-bit uh, gems? <laughs> the question for Joey is, when is the next 16-bit gems episode coming out? Because I think it's been over four months since he's had uh, a video, uh, yeah, an episode. Well, not, not a video, but since the first 16-bit gems episode. proper episode, episode yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm actually currently working on um, Dragon Quest 1, 2, and 3 for the Super Famicom for the next episode, uh, nice. which is, I think, the definitive way to play those three games. Uh, Fortunately, they're all RPGs, and they all take a while <laughs> to capture footage and write and, and all this other stuff. And then come into lovely events, such as the Classic Gaming Expo. Of course. Puts that back a little bit, as does time at the blackjack table. <laughs> <laughs> Losing money in the blackjack. Yes. yes. Uh, I'm hoping for, what's this month? August? I'm hoping for this month. If not, early next month. We're holding you to that. How about, how about we talk about future plans, I guess, for everyone while we're, while we're here? We can just run through. You, have it, you guys want to start your future plans? Billy and Jay? I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, we're going to keep uh, keep doing the show as long as people enjoy watching it or until we just run out of space to put the games. So. <laughs> Quick edit on that. I decided I'm done. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. Well, you have, you have uh, episodes sometimes based around events that you go to. It's not just well, here. There may be a retro classic gaming re uh what, what expo are we in? Classic what, what, where expo. are we at again? Good yeah, we may have an episode or two or three or nine. I'm not going to ask us back now. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> and then also, we're all going to Portland in a month. Portland, Portland Retro Gaming Expo in September. Jeez. Who's, who's going to Portland? Um, I'm going to be in Portland. Joey's going to be in Portland. I was just Joey happy. Jay, I was just happy. Uh, so. uh, how about uh, oh, uh, we got someone in the back? Question or oh. Portland? Uh, the little girl over there. Have a question? The question was what we choose to work here or, or come here to appear? Oh, okay. Um, we well, love retro gaming. Yeah, actually, well, retroware. When John when John and Lance started the site um, five years ago, uh, they live near Digital Press, which is owned by Joe Santulli, who uh, runs the Gaming Expo and the Video Game History Museum cohorts and they've got they've developed a really great working relationship over the past five years and uh, they appreciate what we do uh, so basically we were invited to come out uh, and have a panel and talk to uh, you know talk for deals in the dealer room and make footage all sorts of stuff anything to add Pat? <laughs> I think as an eight-year-old she's asking uh, like what gets you into what got you into games what Continue with passion. You guys started with that, but maybe address it like that. Okay. Um, so, so basically, you're you're young, right? You're younger than us. We're old then compared to you. So, but at one at one point, we were your age, and we grew up playing games like Super Mario Brothers, Pac Man, Sonic the Hedgehog, and we we loved those games as a kid, as kids. You know, it's Legend of Zelda games, and so it's important that nowadays we still look back and why those games were important, why those games were fun. 
why those games mean so much to us and share it to the next generation, like, like you, like other young, young people here, and so that you guys can enjoy those games. Those games are really fun still. You know, you probably play Super Mario Brothers, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> does, that, does, that answer, does that answer your question? What's your favorite game? I like Jungle Hunt and Jungle Hunt. Wow, we're talking yeah, Jungle Hunt games. Very nice. Do you like Super Mario Brothers? <laughs> Yeah, it's an awesome game, huh? <laughs> She'll have more games than you eventually. <laughs> we, have, we have any other questions? Oh, yeah. Actually, you, know, you want to talk about your, your project in more detail, or was there other project? Um, actually, well, I have a trailer out. If you want to watch the trailer, it's on Retro TV. Just a little trailer. Um, I'm working on yeah, gaming trailer. Trailer. It's a trailer. Oh, I have no one's up yet. <laughs> up. Uh, I'm still working on gaming a story, and I'm kind of changing the format a bit to put out more episodes, hopefully every two weeks to once a month. Um, I've got some top secret going on with this guy. It's very oh, top Oh, secret. that's right. Okay. I can't say anything. And possibly uh, Derek Alexander. And Derek, yeah. It's a like happy video game nerd. Triple play. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'll take a I'm also in charge of the articles and user content, so we're working on getting some good written stuff on the site as well. So. You, Pat? My future projects. Um, I'm still going to be pumping out mediocre videos for everyone. When you have um, a mental breakdown and selling off all your games. <laughs> that will probably happen January of next year. I think cool. it's going to. So you guys will find, go on eBay and get stuff dirt cheap. Um, no. Um, we so, got dibs, don't we? You guys have first choice. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, you know, I'm still doing uh, reviews and stuff. I, I have a new series planned that I don't want to reveal right now, but it's going to be somewhat different than what's out there already on the internet. It's kind of hard to be unique nowadays with everyone on YouTube doing. Let's plays and reviews, but I have something you know, decent uh, planned. Uh, other than that, I also have my long-awaited, I guess, uh, update to my collection. I did a collection video three years ago, and in the three since the three years, it's probably tripled in size easily. My collection, and we shot Ian and I. We saw in the video the friend Ian. We shot literally three hours of tape of me going through my entire collection. And by the third tape, Ian's like, "What am I doing?" And I was like, like stumbling over, like exhausted from explaining all this stuff. But that'll probably come out in the next. Probably the next month, it'll probably be like four parts. It'll be like an epic, a magnum opus of, of hoarding uh, <laughs> old games. So that's what's going on. All right. Anything else going on with you guys? Is there a question about it? Oh, question. Yeah, Two, uh, three. Just say, well, I'm actually from that. Uh, what is the, a question A, uh, what's the best thing in your collection? I think one thing in your collection. For, for each of us? The best thing in our collections? Yeah. What, for, for each of us? Everyone. Okay, we'll start. For best things in your collection? I would say either I have Little Samson on the NES and Earthbound for Super Nintendo. <laughs> the funny thing about Earthbound, I've met several people at this particular expo that they, they at some point they have sold off like their entire collection, they just got sick of it, but they it, always keep Earthbound. Including, I sold off all of my collection when I moved um, halfway across the country, so I kept Earthbound and Little Samson. Um, I'm not a huge collector. I'm getting more into it lately, mainly because of these guys. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, one thing I did pick up a couple of years ago is um, one of the prototypes for the NES version of Earthbound, like known as Mother One in Japan. Earthbound for the Super Nintendo is Mother Two in Japan. But uh, that's a whole story. Uh, but yeah, it's one of these prototypes that was essentially finished and never released. Uh, would have been one of the best RPGs on the system, I think. Uh, and I believe there's only three or four known to exist. So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that one. I'm good at buying things. Good at buying <laughs> things. Um, it's a skill. It may not be the best thing in my collection, but my favorite thing is my M82 NES kiosk demo unit. I did a, I did a video about it, a goofy video about it. And what it was, was you'd walk into, you know, we're talking 1988, you'd walk into a KB toy store, you walk into a Kitty City, Lionel Kitty City chain, which I, I cry about, they're still not around because they were better than Toys R Us. Um, and what they'd have is they'd have a setup of a TV. You'd have this kiosk where you put they put 12 carts in. You had a button that you could select through the 12 NES games, and it was like they used it to show off new games. They used it so you can sample games. Like, oh my God, I can play 12 different games at once with the push of a button. I can scroll through it. And it, I remembered it as a kid, and then it took me like five years to find one. And did I overpay for it? Probably. But I guess it's like my first real experience playing an NES game and discovering in the store was through this uh, kiosk. So it's like very special to me. 
I cry now, by the way. <laughs> my, um, um, I got a little Samson too, but he said that, so it's not really that okay. awesome anymore. You can copy him. Do you want to explain, you explain what Little Samson is real quick to the people? They don't know what Little Samson is. Little, little Samson is a side-scrolling um, action game. Uh, came out late in the Nintendo life cycle. Which, 93. Right, which makes it so rare and collectible now. Um, anything late in Nintendo lifespan is uh, pretty sought after. So um, It's a fun game. It's a great game. It, it actually is a fun game. I've played it. Um, There's been a review of it done. Not only a review, the history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and actually, I just picked up at this expo a Custer's Revenge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we have young people in the, in the room. That's it's why I'm not going into any more detail on it. It's disgusting, Jay. <laughs> uh, let's see, for me, it would have to be uh, Flintstone Surprise and Dinosaur Pete. <laughs> uh, found it for any of you who watch the show or those who don't. No, I found it for really, really super cheap. And How super at, cheap? At, well, five bucks. And at the time, it was at the time it was about $200 game. Now it's, I, uh, I think it's selling for around 500 so that's pretty crazy. And Flintstone Surprise at Dinosaur Peak is the second hardest to find licensed NES game. Supposedly it was a blockbuster rental exclusive game, so that makes it extremely hard to find. Is it a good game? It's okay. It's not bad, but it's not worth the price tag in my opinion. But that's just me. <laughs> yeah, just as long as you can steer clear from the hoarders. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, it would be easier to find some, but uh, I also got one more. I got a prototype of the original, uh, the Dino and Hobby uh, Flintstones game one. Nintendo that I found at a thrift store. Caught you slipping. What are you there? <laughs> <laughs> Billy's a big Flintstones fan. Yeah. I, I don't run anything. I'm not really, but it just happens to be my luck in video games runs through Flintstones for whatever reason. It's a coming one. <laughs> right. Any other questions? Question in front again. Yeah. Um, uh, Y'all have such a history of playing so many video games, and a lot of them have superheroes and supervillains. Um, are any of you um, planning to build an evil robot army to take over the world? Question, are we planning to build an evil robot army to take over the world? I'm not sure how I should address it. Would that be giving away our secret plans? It's not evil. Wait till our next cartoon. They're, they're, <laughs> <I'll have some. laughs> we have to consult Joey on building. Yeah, just Joey's an engineer, so yes, we would talk to Joey about that first. I consider them benevolent dictators. <laughs> <laughs> I, for one, welcome our new robot. <laughs> Any other questions? Non evil robot related? Yeah. Up front? Who has the biggest game collection out of all of you? Oh, uh, so many jokes. It's not even hard. That long. might be Pat. Yeah? yeah. How, how many yeah. games well, do you flat out have? Wait a minute, Lance has a quite a big collection. I think me and Lance are like neck and neck, but I'm not sure. I think Pat has more NES games than I have total games. Probably. Um, <laughs> I, I don't. Know exactly how many, but it's probably a few thousand games, somewhere in that neighborhood. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm including doubles or not. And of course, you're not married, right? Of course. Of course. What, are you, what are you trying to say? <laughs> you say I, something unhealthy about having 3,000 video games? It makes it a little bit easier. Okay. Just, just a question. Just a question. How many against women? Of course. I'm just saying they might actually check your craziness every once in a while. I think I'm fine. <laughs> it's normal, I think. Breakdown's coming. <laughs> uh, me, I'm probably in the 700 range, maybe, maybe. I'll go with 800, just the one up. <laughs> it's not the quantity, it's the quality that counts. That's right, Flintstones. I think I, think I, have, I, think I have less than 100. Snow Brothers. Yeah, I, I have smatterings of titles from all a bunch of different systems, but my largest is probably Super Nintendo. It's like 130 or so. I <laughs> No, it's not. I have more. I don't like the Super Nintendo. He has more than I do. I'm a Super Nintendo guy. And they all have to be boxed and in pristine condition, right? That's true. I am OCD, so I need to have them with like the boxes and the instruction manuals, <coughs> maps, and cards. All right. <sighs> Any other questions before Joey goes off on more of a tangent? Man, we're doors. I have to wash my hands. After <laughs> Rubber gloves before you you touch your Chrono Trigger. Complete a box. Oh yes. Oh. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> I think, well, I guess it's gonna, we, we are, we're good for time. Yeah, so thanks for coming out. Thanks for the pleasant experience for having